Chair Swinson. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I also take the opportunity to congratulate you, uh, as this is the first time I've spoken while uh, you have been in the chair. I'm delighted to follow the Honourable Member for North East Derbyshire, who I think made uh, a very uh, powerful and convincing case uh, in favour of transparency for the Backbench Business Committee, which I would wholeheartedly endorse. And I would also very much endorse what she said about uh, three members in particular who are no longer here, uh, Tony Wright, Evan Harris and Mark Fisher, who did so much to uh, campaign for this and bring it to fruition. I have to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I am somewhat disappointed that we're discussing this today. And the reason for my disappointment was uh, that in the last Parliament, in the debates in February and indeed uh, in March, on the 4th of March, this House uh, passed a resolution to say that it looks forward to the House being offered the opportunity to establish, in time for the start of the next Parliament, a backbench business committee. Here we are several weeks into the next Parliament and unfortunately this was not done in time for the start of this Parliament. And that was, I have to say, despite uh, on both the 11th and the 18th of March assurances from the Right Honourable Member, the Lady for Camberwell and Peckham, saying, I can assure the House that we will bring forward the standing orders and there will be an opportunity for the House to endorse them before the next election on the 11th of March. Um, column 433. And on the 18th of March, she said, I am under a duty and a responsibility to ensure that this happens before the next Parliament. And that unfortunately did not happen. And I think that is a, a great tragedy. But perhaps it should also serve as a salutary lesson for those of us in this House who are keen to see reforms progress in general. And I suspect that that is most of the members uh, that are here in the Chamber right now, uh, that there is not always an easy path to reform. And it is therefore important that uh, we people who are reform-minded make sure that we uh, continue to campaign rather than assume that everything will be fine just because the House has passed a motion on something. I am, however, absolutely delighted that the Leader of the House and the Deputy Leader have brought forward these motions so speedily in this new Parliament. And I think that does go some way to make amends for the House's inability to get this done before dissolution. I'm especially pleased to see my uh, honourable friend, the member for Somerton and Froome, uh, in his position. I think it's one that he was made for, as he has always been a staunch defender of Parliament and indeed of backbenchers. And I know that all of us eager to see reform happen take great comfort knowing that the Leader and Deputy Leader of the House are also very much reform minded. This is indeed a historic transfer of power from the government to backbenchers in terms of control of business of this House. And given the new government's uh, passion for decentralisation, perhaps it is the case that decentralisation is starting at home. And so the comments that I will make are very much in that spirit of being supportive of the Leader and Deputy Leader's efforts to progress reform, but I do want to tease out some of the issues which I think perhaps could even be improved upon further. On the Backbench Business Committee, uh, it's clearly excellent that this will now be set up with the uh, orders uh, laid before the House today. But I think there is still a, a slight concern and issue over the number of days allocated, as I raised in business questions last week. The right report suggested 35 days for backbench business, but I do very much understand that the motivation uh, that the Leader and Deputy Leader have for splitting this 35 days between this House and indeed Westminster Hall is to enable proper scrutiny of legislation by allocating additional days to report stages of bills. And I think that has been a, a, a valid criticism of how bills have gone through in the past, where they haven't had that <coughs> proper scrutiny at report stage and whole swathes of bills have been left undiscussed on the floor of this House. So I do understand that motivation, but I, I am very much hoping that at least the amendment A to Order 4 which would put 27 days uh, in the standing order, is going to be accepted. I think that would certainly go some way to reassuring. I'm very pleased that that is the case. The other issue I would want to probe uh, my honourable friend on, and perhaps he will be able to address this in his summing up remarks, is that I appreciate that this is about moving towards right, rather than the right reforms being implemented all in one go. So with the agreement that 27 days of backbench business will be in this chamber being accepted, does that mean that in future years there will be a move towards increasing that from 27? Uh, I hope that there will be a, a, something positive my honourable friend can say on that because uh, I think that would certainly uh, be very helpful. And obviously we are at the very beginning of a new parliament when uh, with a new government the legislative programme uh, is very heavy and perhaps as the parliament continues there might be additional time on the 
the floor of this House for backbench business. I also think it is worth looking at innovative use of time to create this backbench business, such as the fact that we have Tuesday mornings or Wednesday evenings, some of which have already been mentioned in reference to private members' business. Uh, but I think that, that is definitely worth looking at. The second issue I wanted to raise on the Backbench Business Committee was that of permanence. Because we have these uh, ideas being put forward that every year it should be re-elected and that there should be a review of its uh, progress and how well it's working in a year's time. And in a sense that sounds very good. As a Democrat I like elections and as somebody that likes to learn to how, how we can do things better then a review can sound like quite a good idea. But taken together, these two uh, motions also cause a certain amount of concern and there is a genuine danger that that review could be used to try to uh, get rid of the Backbench Business Committee and that annual elections um, could be seen as a useful opportunity uh, if the Backbench Business Committee was seen as being perhaps too effective uh, as a route for the whips to try to remove any particularly effective chair uh, through that annual election. One, one issue I think is very, um, very pertinent to this is the issue of who will vote for the Backbench Business Committee members. Because if the government effectively has a block vote of more than 100 MPs, then it becomes very difficult for any candidate who is not supported by the government to actually become the chair of the Backbench Business Committee. Now, we recently elected the chairs of select committees, and the convention, as I think originally rep uh, recommended by the Procedure Committee, was that any ministers or indeed PPSs would not vote in the election for the select committee chair of that particular department. And I wonder, although it wasn't something which was explicit in the right report, I wonder whether it may be possible for the government to take a same self-denying ordinance in terms of voting for members and the chair of the backbench business committee. It would not seem unreasonable to have the backbench business committee representing backbenchers elected by backbenchers. And I think if that could be done, that would perhaps assuage some of the concerns about annual elections. I also want to press uh, my honourable friend a little further on the issue I intervened on uh, the Leader of the House with, which was the, um, the order uh, number three, section 1C. This wasn't just relating to the chair of the, select, the backbench business committee. This was actually relating to any candidate for becoming a member of that committee. And it clearly says that to be nominated, there must be no fewer than 10 members of the candidate's party nominating them. That does exclude members of the Scottish National Party, Plaid Cymru, the other minority parties, and indeed independent candidates. I, I'm very pleased to take an intervention from my honourable friend on that point. I, I'm most grateful to my uh, honourable friend. She has, she has spotted a, a defect, I think, in the proposals, but I have to say it's not a defect in the proposals put forward by my right honourable friend and myself, it's a defect in the proposals from the right committee, uh, which unfortunately was not spotted in the, in the, in the motion drafted, drafted by the committee, and I accept entirely what she says about the uh, unfortunate effects of, of that, and I think it's something we may want to look at again, but, uh, but, but I hope she will accept our defence that here we have religiously stuck to the recommendation and indeed the draft motion of the right committee. I uh, very much uh, appreciate uh, that intervention from my honourable friend and that reassurance and uh, I'm sure this is something which can be, uh, can be solved and certainly the Speaker seems to be given a lot of power in these elections as almost a de facto returning officer so I suspect there may be a solution that can indeed be found to that. Turning to the issue of private members' bills, and in particular the two um, amendments that stand in my name, uh, Amendment D to, to Order 2 and Amendment B to Order 4, I just want to uh, sort of share with the House why I, I think this is an important issue uh, to be addressed. And I do appreciate there are some new members uh, of the House present, and I do not wish to scare them or put them off, but I did just want to describe my experience of the horror of Friday sittings. I think the first, uh, one of, or certainly one of the first Fridays I attended was actually uh, a private member's bill by the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Edinburgh North and Leith, uh, who was bringing forward a private member's bill about climate change, uh, and uh, it was one that I was very keen to support, as were many of my constituents keen for me to do so. And there was a, a bill second in the order paper, which was about the management of energy in buildings. And we thought, well, there's, there's five hours in, in the chamber. We might even be able to get one second reading done and another second reading well underway. Um, we hadn't counted on the two-hour speech by one honourable member and then another honourable member standing to try to make a similar length of speech. And, of course, 
to get a private member's bill passed, you need to have 100 MPs for the closure vote. So there were dozens and dozens of MPs in the chamber who had come along to support this, this private member's bill and indeed wanted to uh, make some comments on the record and intervention or so on. But had we all done that, then the bill itself would have been talked out because one or two members were being, in my view, frankly quite rude, um, about using that time to talk the bill out. And, uh, and I remember vividly sitting there thinking, if I want this bill to go through, I have to just be quiet and not say anything, not even say I support the bill, and I accept that. But along with many other new members at that time, I left the chamber absolutely appalled and furious that this was the way that we did our business and I thought it absolutely had to change and what was interesting was speaking to members that had been here for longer, they had sort of got used to it and, uh, and just said well that's the way that it is and I just remembered thinking I never want to get like that, I never want to accept that this ridiculous way of working is the way that it has to be so, um, so I, I, do, I, I do suspect fellow new MPs will be equally appalled if that happens but there is the opportunity I'm sure um, to make that change because it does need to change, I'll certainly give way to them I'm grateful to Honourable Lady for giving way, and uh, I certainly remember well the progress of that particular private member's bill, and also grateful for her support on that occasion also. What she will also uh, recall is that uh, that bill uh, didn't just come back on one Friday, I think it had to come back a total of three Fridays, precisely because some members chose to use their right to speak at length, repeatedly. Uh, would she therefore agree that underlines the case for more the case that until such time as there's a more fundamental reform procedure for private members' bills, then we don't want to lose any days for private members' bill discussion on Friday. That's why we should actually support the amendment from the Honourable Gentleman from Wellingborough. Absolutely. The Honourable Member is quite right, and I certainly do think that the, uh, the amendment in the name of the Honourable Gentleman for Wellingborough is a very sensible one, and it just, as he um, outlined, goes back to a fair allocation of the equivalent of 13 days per year, spread over two years, the 26 days. And, uh, and indeed, my amendments would also introduce uh, the ability for the Backbench Business Committee to programme remaining stages of private members' bills, so that once the bill had received its uh, second reading, then there would be able to be a timetabling motion, and that would mean that the ability for members to talk out the bill would at that point uh, be gone. I think it should be gone ideally from the very beginning of private members' bills and if, if people want to defeat a private members' bill they should do so on the merits of the argument and votes in this House. Uh, but I think that that amendment is a, would be a good step uh, in the right direction. And, uh, and so, uh, as I say, I do support that amendment, but I think that, uh, that changing the, the ability to have programming in private members' bills uh, would be helpful. I was very... Uh, pleased to hear the chair of the procedure uh, committee saying that this will be an issue that his committee will be looking at more widely because I do very much accept that my amendment and the amendment uh, by the Honourable Member for Wellingborough are, are only uh, small parts of the problem and that the issue of private members bills needs to be looked at much more in the round and more generally uh, including the issue of Friday sittings but I would very much urge that such a report should be um, conducted quickly and acted on soon so that we don't lose the momentum uh, for reform. We definitely don't want that just to be an excuse to kick these issues into the long grass. Um, and I'd very much hope that uh, ultimately if we do get some good recommendations on that, then the demoralising and soul-destroying experience that many MPs have sat through on <coughs> frustrating Fridays will be a thing of the past. Um, I was very pleased to hear that Order 13 is not going to be moved this evening because I have to say I think that uh, order on the, uh, the paper today is one of the best arguments against leaving things to the usual channels uh, that I've ever come across in a long time. Uh, expanding three uh, select committees to 16 members was a very inelegant solution cooked up by the whips without even consulting the chairs of those three select committees, uh, which just uh, beggars belief. Uh, the, the route report was clear that uh, 11 should be the maximum number on a select committee, but there is a genuine problem here about making sure that there is representation for the minority parties. And there's different ways of of solving it. My understanding is that what happened uh, in the previous Parliament was uh, that uh, the Liberal Democrats, when in opposition, made sure that of the places who were allocated, some of those uh, went to the minority parties. And I know that certainly happened from time to time with statutory instruments and other such committees. One would think that one solution might well be for Labour to be uh, similarly generous and make sure uh, that that happens. Another solution might just be to add one minority party representative to the committee rather than them having an additional four members. Also, um, 
if necessary, to maintain the government opposition balance, perhaps adding a government member. But the, the uh, arguments for adding five extra people to select committees, I just think, do not stand up. And I'm very, very pleased that the government has listened on this issue and is going away to find a better solution. But it is important that a solution is found. And I would just conclude, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, by saying that looking in the spirit of the right report, we also need to not forget that there is further reform required radical and exciting as the reforms today are. Um, it should not stop here. Uh, the involving the public section of the right report was one which I felt that there was a lot of good ideas but much further work needed to be done, particularly as regards petitioning, online engagement of this place. I think there are good ideas and indeed reformers on all sides of this House and on issues like this we have been practising the new politics for a very long time in cross-party working. Uh, and with the Leader and the Deputy Leader both so positively disposed to reform, I am for one very optimistic that most of the motions on the order paper today will be an important next step in the vital reform of this House.